Good evening and welcome to Artist Talk and Art on Monday, February 27th, 2023 at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'm Doug Shear, president of ATOA, and this is Artist Talk and Art in its 49th year. Tonight, we present a dialogue with artist Despo Magoni, interviewed by historian and professor Talia Varkoupoulos. Despo Magoni is an internationally recognized artist because of her gestural yeah. style and oh, can yeah. mostly be associated with the 1980s neo-expressionism. Because of her continuous engagement with current issues, Magoni remains relevant, challenging the status quo. Tonight's Zoom will run about 90 minutes and is copyright, copyrighted by Artists Talk on Art. The recording will be subsequently posted to the ATOA YouTube channel. You can just go to Artist Talk on Art on YouTube. Join us next week on Monday, March 6th, when I'll be moderating a three artist panel of abstractionists who are in a group show at the Lockwood Gallery in Kingston, New York called Driven to Abstraction. <laughs> I'm also appearing in that show. Uh, the opening is Saturday the 4th at 4 p.m. and Lockwood is located at 747 Route 28 in Kingston. At the end of tonight's presentation, we have reserved 15 minutes for your questions, uh, which you are invited to enter into the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And I will address them to either Despo or Talia appropriately. Talia Vakoupoulos holds a doctorate in the philosophy of art history from the City University of New York Graduate School. She has served as a curator for over 100 national and international exhibitions accompanied by scholarly catalogs. Dr. Verkuplis is a full-time professor of the visual arts at John Jay College of Criminal Justice of the City University of New York. She has written scholarly essays and reviews for New York Arts Magazine, Visual Culture AD, Part, Plus Minus Zero, Public Art, Art and Culture, Art in Asia, and Sculpture, and has been included in many international panels. Dr. Verkuplis recently co-authored a book by Hilla Rebe, the founder of the Guggenheim Museum, which was released in December 2005 by the Edwin Mellon Research Press. Dr. Verkuplis' contributions have been recorded and have become a permanent record of the Yale Library collection of accomplished women in the arts. I'm also pleased to say that Talia was a board member of Artist Talk on Art in the past and the organizer or moderator of a number of panels. Talia. Yes, it was really a pleasure to, to do those panels also. And I, as soon as I get less busy, I, I would like to resume that role. Um, You're welcomed. Thank you. Tonight, I'm very, very honored uh, to be interviewing one of the most significant artists of this and last century, two centuries, you went over two centuries anyway. Oh, oh. Uh, and uh, I'm very, very happy uh, to be interviewing not only a wonderful artist, but a dear friend for over 35 years. Uh, and uh, I'd like to, uh, hello Despo. I'd hello. like to at the beginning and let me know if you, uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yes. Okay. I'd like to go back to the beginning and start with being the art historian, of course. Um, I know that you studied at the Athens School of Fine Arts. And I also know that it's primarily a school, well, it primarily teaches uh, acad uh, academic training. It gives you an academic training. Uh, and I'm just curious as to uh, whether you feel this helped you in the long run and what the differences might be between the education that was academic from Greece uh, and what you might have had here had you been living in the United States at the time and how they might differ. Well, 
I had six years. I cannot see myself. We can see you. Oh, you can see me. Okay. Yes. I had six years of uh, uh, rigorous academic training at the Athens School of Fine Arts, uh, drawing from plaster cast, later on to live model, doing uh, hundreds of, upon hundreds of portraits, notes, etc. On top of that, we had two years of uh, uh, anatomy. At the time, and I'm talking from 1962 to 1967, I resented it because uh, I had heard that uh, other art schools abroad, uh, uh, the students didn't have to go through the tedious uh, training of drawing uh, before they start doing their own thing. Actually, years after I had uh, immigrated to the United States, a colleague, it was, I think, in the 80s, yes, in early 80s, a colleague of mine said that he was going back to our students' league to learn how to draw because he had reached a dead end. Well, uh, when I reached a dry point in my, my <laughs> Uh, work, I start, uh, I take an object, put it in front of me, I start to draw it. And that helps me to loosen up and find my way to my new body of work. Uh, well, uh, I don't know what kind of training people are getting here, but I know that uh, the training I had has influenced me uh, has influenced my work the same way that the country I was born in and my adopted country has uh, influenced me. What uh, I owe to all that training is that I learned how to see things, how to examine things, and to study, to study the world around me and in particular, the human body and face and their endless potential. And later on, of course, I had the tools that helped me to deal with my mature work that was about the human condition. So can, you, can we please have the first two slides so that we can show you what that early work looked like, Iruna? The first two slides, please. The PowerPoint I sent. Thank you. So you can, okay, the first and the second. No, the, go back. Go back. Go back. Okay. Okay. So this is Nana, a fellow student. That day we didn't have a model, so she volunteered. Here you can see how I use the line in order to shape and form and make a realistic portrait. The work was done in charcoal. The next... With the chiaroscuro of the academy, of the academic Yes. Teams. Well, this is a portrait of Costa. This is the first painting I did when uh, we came to the States in 1969. And this is the last one that I have signed with Greek uh, characters. And in this portrait, you can see the, the influence of the school of, uh, of uh, Munich, the dark colors. Right. Can you tell us about Costa a little bit and why you immigrated to the United States? Well, our intention was not to immigrate. He just finished the, the medical school in Greece and we came here for his uh, training. So the idea was to spend uh, four to five years and then go back. But when the training was over, we decided to stay here. And we we have not we didn't regret I regret it. Was it rough going in the beginning as an immigrant? Learning a new language. Well, I had eight years of English before I came here. Of course, when I came here, I I, I didn't dare to open my mouth. But anyway, yeah, no, it was not easy, but uh, we managed. 
Okay. Uh, can we have the next slide? Thank you. Oh, this is the absurdity of dreams. Well, through my life, I had a lot of absurd dreams, and I was keeping notes of them. And uh, in 1986, I decided to make a series. Here you can see the 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 body has still some uh, uh, realistic uh, element. Well, the the influence from doing the live studies in anatomy with anatomy, right? At the, the of course, of course, it's obvious that I had uh, an academic training. Right. Even when I distort my work. Even when you distort it. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, I noticed that, uh, well, here too, the academic training shows, except that you can distort, you you have the freedom to distort that, what you learned. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. of course. Okay. okay. This is a, I love this series of the screaming box. You can see the distorted uh, face, and uh, that represents the the irony, the angst of the man of the twentieth century. It was done in the twentieth century. Now I don't know what is uh, uh, the anxiety of the person of the twenty first century. Well, you've always worked with the existential scream, that's for sure, and that's why your men are you or your your pawns later on in the Queen series always screaming um, from this pain of the, the and angst. Um, well, we start our life with a scream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and my next question, okay, since you went to the next slide, it's okay, keep it. Go to the next slide, please. No, this, this, is, this goes to another question. Yes, yeah, so I'm about to ask you. <laughs> I noticed, uh, look in looking at your work over many many years, I noticed that you do have done more two dimensional works rather than three dimensional works. So, uh, how would you describe yourself? I, I think you are a, more of a painter than a sculptor. Am I correct? Uh, definitely, I'm a painter, of course. Okay. I was growing up in in Greece in the fifties. I was exposed to a lot of. Uh, uh, sculpture rather than painting. I was going to the museum and see the, uh, the treasures of antiquity and I could see contemporary uh, sculpture in the parks of uh, Athens. Even there was sculpture in uh, the cemeteries. Uh, for painting, we had only one place, Parnassos. It was a cultural center, and at the first floor of that uh, building, they had a space just for exhibitions. And my mother was taking me there to look at the uh, painting, which was mostly uh, landscapes and uh, the portraits of prominent uh, Athenians. And it was there at uh, the uh, exhibition place of uh, space of Parnassos that I realized that uh, I wanted to be uh, a painter. Anyway, since I was a kid, I was always with a pencil in my head drawing. And I was drawing um, women with elaborate uh, dresses that I had seen in the movies. But uh, I never had the desire or the curiosity to make something three-dimensional with the plastiline like the other kids were doing. So my answer is yes. I didn't have a dilemma. I was a I was a painter. Can we have but, the next slide, please? But I have done some some three dimensional pieces. We skipped the first one. Well, we just did. We just looked at the happy together, and now we're looking at the torture. Yeah, the torture. The torture. Well. I put uh, two uh, separate items together, uh, an old fashioned plier and a, a silhouette, or not a silhouette, uh, a miniature sculpture. I can't find the word, the right word. Figure, figure. Fig figuring, thank you, figuring, that my friend Jean had brought me from Russia years ago. So I put these two together and I call it the torture. 
torture is happening all over the world in civilized countries and not uncivilized. So it's a, it's a contemporary piece. Now this is very tiny, very small. Yes. What about the scale? You usually work in the large scale. Well, it depends on the objects that I put together. These are were small objects. Oh, yeah. my no. sculpture, if you can call it sculpture, it's small. My paintings used to be large. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Well, these are the keys to paradise. I had a box with the zillions of keys that uh, they didn't serve any purpose anymore. So I threw the ones that I didn't like and I put together this one with a string and I call them keys to paradise. This is sort of like the ready-mades of Duchamp, isn't it? Oh, no, no, stay with the keys, please. Well, Duchamp has influenced all of us in a different way, yeah. Right. Right. But with the keys, they were ready made objects that you appropriated and created a new work. So well, all, I have noticed that all machines, when they are not used anymore, they I, I consider them pieces of sculpt, uh, sculpture. Mm -hmm. Great. It's great. Um, and that goes for the last piece also that we saw, right? Yeah, that was the last uh, image for this uh, question, I think. Yes, yes, dear. <laughs> Can we have the next slide, please? No, uh, you're going to see a series of people in the news images. And my the question that I put to, to Despo is a little bit long, so I'm going to read it. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, you developed your style into what would later be called neo-expressionist. One of the most ardent admirers of your style was Samo, a young man who attended your show in 1978 at the Nansen Gallery, which represented you at the time. In 1980, you both exhibited in the same show again at the Nansen Gallery. Samo would later become known as Jean-Michel Basquiat, the artist whose style was impacted by your work. Yet it is difficult to explain why his value rose so high in the art market while after the 80s, you worked quietly in your studio. But then, as David Smith would say to Jean Ciron, you are an artist's artist and they appreciate you. Some other artists working in the same style, for example, Julian Schnabel, George Basilitz, uh, George Immendorf, Marcus Lupertz, A.R. Pank, to name a few, uh, somewhat lost their popularity after the heyday of neo-expressionism. Others, like Bascat, maintained it. What is your viewpoint about this? Well, in 1978, I exhibited the People in the New series at, uh, as you mentioned, at the Nonson Gallery in Soho. Uh, People in the News in the 70s was a column in the New York Times about the rich and famous. At the same time, at other parts of the newspaper, there were news about uh, wars uh, and other calamities that are taking place in uh, here and, uh, and abroad. So I decided to, in this body of work, to put a face to those uh, uh, wretched uh, people, and I painted their tortured faces right on the newspaper, on the newsprint. Mm -hmm. And for each, each individual uh, portrait, I picked a word or a phrase from that uh, page and uh, put it as a title. I, I'm, I, I'm very particular about titles. I love titles. Mm -hmm. I see that. So one day during the show, a young African-American uh, man came who was handsome and rather shy and spent quite some time looking at the work. And when he was uh, done looking, approached me to say that he liked my work very much. Well, uh, he started coming regularly at the gallery and he became friends with the younger artists uh, there. 
And when in 1980, the gallery put together a group show with the title, uh, A New Decade in Art, uh, he was invited to uh, participate with, the, with one piece. Uh, at the same year, in December of the same year, 1980, uh, Samo uh, uh, organized an exhibition at the basement of St. Mark's Church in East Village. And he invited me to participate with the. Uh, can you scroll down and look at the piece? At the... Can we look at. Yes, next slide, please. That's what I was trying to say. No, it's not the next, it's the last, the last one. Right, but. But I don't want to skip over these because these are also... Well, he asked me to participate with the hostages held for unknown reasons. Can okay. we look at that piece? Well, then we have to go back and forth. Yes, I guess so. Keep going. Uh-oh. Yeah. There we go. And after that show, and that was the end of our brief encounter. Uh, I at that time, unfortunately, uh, the gallery went under for lack of money, and all of us, or every artist, went out looking for a new venue to show our work. And uh, when I saw Samo again, he was on the cover of the New York Times magazine, and by that time, he was uh, famous, and his name was uh, uh, Jean Michel Basquiat. Now, why his, uh, uh, the value of his work has skyrocketed and mine hasn't? Well, how can I answer that? Well, I cannot speculate. Uh, definitely, his work uh, was uh, unique, but he was also lucky to be at the right the time, at the right place. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Also, the fact that... Uh, he died so young and tragically, turned him into a legend. Right. Yes. One of my favorite professors, Jack Flam, always said that. You have to be in the right place at the right time to really make it big. Yeah. We, we skipped some images from the... We could, yeah. I had the Buscat image, but it, it's not letting us show it, so it's okay. But oh, okay. this, really, this really encapsulates his style, this particular one, the open mouth, the teeth, uh, the lines that really, really, the anatomical uh, line that we see that is vertical and horizontal. And uh, don't you think, Despo? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, but also the images themselves, the subjects, the screaming person, the screaming man, the skulls, the, the teeth, the open mouths, and the existentialist scream. That's very much similar. Okay. Can we go ahead or do you want to? Yes. Okay. Okay, stop. No, no. Go back one. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so uh, our next question is about the subjects that were based on social issues then as they are now, because you're still very much socially relevant as an artist. You have always dealt with important social issues, and but you still are. Um, and so do these themes um, arise from a desire for justice? And if so, was it born from a person from personal experience is what I wanted to ask you. Well, yes, of course. When I was born, Greece was under the German occupation. And when the war ended in 1945, we had the civil war, which lasted for four years. So I spent the early years of my life in a place that was uh, 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 scary and uh, uncertain. And, uh, and yeah, and uh, I still remember my parents covering the windows with dark blue paper and uh, not having electricity. And uh, I can hear the, the sounds of, of war and I can see the, the bullet holes on the walls of, uh, Buildings. of the houses. 
So at a very young age, became aware of the cruelty of war and injustice and the uh, anguish of, pe pe yeah, of people. Right. And uh, of course, uh, in 1967, we had another dictatorship in Greece. And I saw one of our neighbors left his neighbors to be dragged out uh, from his house to be sent God knows where. So yes, I have experiences. What about the experience with your own uncle? My aunt and my grandfather. My grandfather was tortured by the Germans and by, and my uncle by by the Greeks. So because the left this. Yeah. Yeah. Those were the days. And I've heard so many stories. So many stories. They would come to but your house. Maybe who I am. Thank you. I made me an expressionist. Yes. So here we have abandoned number two. Could you speak to that a little bit? Well, in uh, 1980, on the front page of the New York Times, there was uh, this image of uh, a person born in uh, uh, Vietnam. In Vietnam, thank you, by a Vietnamese mother and American father. All these children were abandoned. Nobody wanted them. The Americans didn't want them, and the uh, Vietnamese didn't want them. And I was uh, moved by the story that I read in the newspaper, and I was uh, yeah inspired to do these two images that are somehow similar. And you, and you took them from the pages of the New York Times again? They are the front page of the New York Times magazine, yes. And you pasted parts of them and then you drew the other three. I, I pasted yeah one and then the other one is the rest is drawing drawing. Right. Right. Yeah I use a lot of collage in my work. Yeah. That is very true. Yes, thank you. Um the next I, one please I prefer this one. Prefer this one, but hold on, hold on. Go back. Thank you. This is abandoned also. This is about yeah. the yeah. themes of war and uh, abandonment and what happens during the war as a result of wars. So now you- This is the actual uh, uh, picture taken from the newspaper and the figures behind it are the, the ghosts of the other lost souls. Uh -huh. Okay, and there's some more images coming next. Go ahead. Slide please? Well, actually, this is the horrors of war. This is a triptych, but we could not show it here as a triptych. So, of course, this is a scene of war, and uh, a woman, always there, a woman, men are making war, the war, and uh, women carry the dead and the wounded. They cry and bury them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's been historically correct, although there's more and more women joining the forces, right? So that's yeah, equality, of course. Changing also. Yeah. Can we see the next uh, part of the triptych, please? Thank you. So this is a man, right? Correct. Well, this is a man, and the picture speaks for itself. Yeah. And uh, he is. Has red hands, right? And yes. red someone is hanging there, and of course there is a skeleton, a, a skull. And He's sitting on a skull. He 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 created this mess. The man created the mess of war, and now does not know what to do. Wow. Yeah. Can we have the next slide, please, so we can see the whole triptych? Yeah, this is the third part. This is somehow similar to the- Go back one, please. Thank you. Yeah, again, we have a woman carrying the wounded. Can we go back one, please? Miruna, thank you. So this is a man that the woman is carrying, right? Yes, definitely. It's obvious it's a man, yeah. Yes. 
which uh, it really is a very nice segue to our next question about your feminist icons. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Now, you have posed, you have showed women throughout the years as heroines, as very strong people. Um, and this is what this knife thrower's assistant, but also as expendable, right? Because these are uh, a, um, an assistant of a knife thrower is an expendable person, correct? Yeah. Um, so what is your feeling about this? This is your personal take on, uh, on the role of gender. So could you please elaborate a little bit on that? Well, in my feminist work, I take the female body in order to show the roles that women have played uh, through uh, in society through uh, historical, mythical, and contemporary times. They were all strong women that uh, were fighting, no matter how scared they might have been. And uh, I start with the Knife Thrower's Assistant, a series that uh, I, I exhibited at the Alternative Museum in 1984. Uh, well, uh, the, in the theater or the circus, there is a, a dramatic act taking place. A blindfolded man uh, throws the daggers, the knives, at, uh, towards a woman that is usually young and beautiful and wears very little. Uh, at the end of the performance, the man gets all the applause and the woman is lucky that uh, she's, she's alive. Still alive. Yeah. yeah. The woman put herself in danger in order to provide excitement to the crowd. Mm -hmm. And this is a very dramatic series. I, I love that series. The woman, the woman is uh, like a, a wounded animal, but she's still there, standing. Mm -hmm. oh. And my next uh, heroine is um, Salome. Uh, Salome, I, I'll can we have the next slide, please? Excuse me, Despo. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Salome, uh, according to the story, was a princess. And uh, uh, I made two versions. The first one, uh, Salome uh, obeys her mother, who asked her to dance for the king and ask as a favor the head of uh, St. John the Baptist. But in this version, the, the Salome's dream, we see him see her dancing ecstatic because she decided not to obey her mother or anybody else and decide for herself. And she's dancing holding the head of uh, the of the king. Instead of St. John, right? Yeah. She tried to, I tried to change history actually for trading in this way. Yes, that's wonderful. Very dynamic, isn't it? Yes. I love that piece. And powerful because of the colors also. And the movie. She was powerful because she had made up her own mind. She mm -hmm. decided for herself. Mm -hmm. All right. Can we have the next, the next image, please? Oh, the next uh, series is The Queen's Moves in a Game of Chess. I, I started the series in 1989 and I finished it in 1982. Uh, the queen, uh, no, yeah, chess is a game of uh, strategy, not of luck. And uh, it is an intellectual game. And the queen is the only member, the only female uh, uh, part in the in the game and the more powerful she can move all over the chessboard but all her uh, work is done just to secure the position of the king to the throne 
So I have made 11 moves. Can we show, can we see a few more? Okay. In this series, right? In the okay. series, yes. Slide, please. And after the 11th, yeah. After the 11th move, the queen in my series decided to keep uh, the throne to herself. And I portrayed her as uh, Queen Elizabeth I, that uh, she never got married. She refused to share her throne with uh, anybody else. The whole series starts with the castle. Can we look at the castle? Next, yes. Or rook, as we call it in, in chess. And of course, it represents uh, power. And all the game is uh, for power. Who will, uh, you know, uh, be the strongest man, the king. And it ends with uh, eight pawns that the more uh, help me with the word, the pawns are dis indispensable. The women are dispensable, right? We yes. We talked about how the yes. women... The, pawn the pawns too, the pawns too. The, the pawns also. The soldiers. Yeah. The regular soldiers. Yeah. Women also. I mean, historically, if you go back to ancient China, the Jia dynasty, you go back to ancient Greece with the Vienna, you, you know, throughout the centuries, you find that women were uh, disposable. In other words, they were sacrificed for the sake of attaining greater glory or money or, you know, econ economics. It was a matter of economics where you have arranged marriages throughout the centuries and the girls had no say in who they were marrying. So that's the, the I find that really fascinating, a really fascinating issue. So, yeah. Um, did you have anything more to say about the Queen series? Well, yes, I think it's a metaphor for our uh, patriarchal society. Yeah, it is. Okay, so, um, if we go to the next image, thank you. Um, we we see that uh, Des was moving on to a kind of a abstracted work, which is, is a, a little bit difficult to kind of uh, bring to terms with a whole lifetime of representational work, right? That we've seen thus far. Um, the, these are her the, her stars and comets and astrology series. So I wonder, Despa, could you please speak a little bit about what made you uh, switch? Uh, I know you continue your representational work, but at this particular point and time in your life, you were creating more abstracted works. Could you tell us a little bit about the reason for that? Well, I had just finished my series, uh, The 1001 Nights where I, nights, see, the sky, nights, where I had examined the another powerful woman, uh, Seherazad. Seherazad, yes. And uh, when I finished the series, I decided to leave all the human path, pathos and tragedy on earth behind me and to look up in the sky, which is vast, mysterious, and eternal. So I, I started with the Musica Universalis and uh, what I, I, you might also say that it's a matter of uh, <laughs> the physical versus the spiritual. So you're leaving the physical behind or the material behind and you're going towards the spiritual. Well, yes, when I was a kid and was looking at the sky, the beautiful sky, I was pretending that all the stars were the souls of the of the dead people. And uh, I remember some summer nights in uh, in the islands of Greece, I was looking at the sky and I was uh, hearing the the uh, creatures uh, chirping, whatever. And I was imagining that they were the souls speaking to themselves. Anyway, childish uh, imagination. Mm, that's very nice. So in this uh, musical Universalis, I, I have painted a crowded uh, sky 
where planets are moving constantly without managing to not to, to collide. In the, can we look at another image? Sure. Next slide. Yes, in the orbits and uh, the infinity, the infinity and the orbits. I have imagined a, an eternally, a continuously expanding uh, universe where new uh, uh, planets are uh, formed. And if we go further down. Next slide. Yes, so the celestial crossing. I have put all the celestial planets uh, together that uh, rotate uh, each one to its own uh, rhythm and uh, uh, remain uh, and the order and the sky remains always the same while things in uh, on earth change constantly uh, empires are uh, rising and the empires are falling but the order in the sky remains eternal right that's marvelous you see your line really your line is so important here it really conveys this idea of crossings so well as if it is a bridge something as as the way we cross a bridge almost. I, I love working on that series mm. because I, I was doing something that was beautiful. Not that my previous work was not beautiful, but uh, it was uh, different. Difficult. Yeah. Different and difficult. Yes. Yeah. This, this body of work does not demand anything from you just to look at it and enjoy it. Well, that's a matter of opinion. You know, it depends on who's looking at it. You know, we can all have a different, we can we can see it from a different perspective according to our experiences. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So can we have the next slide, please? Uh oh, okay. Okay. Um, and now we come to the multi-part installations because this is what happens next. You start making works that are not monumental as they used to be. They're small pieces, but when put together, they become monumental, right? Yeah. Um, and so you you have multi, many multiple pieces that are put together to make a larger installation. It's largely installation work. So this one is called Day by Day. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this? Well, let me tell you, uh, you, you said that I was uh, doing uh, big pieces. Well, when I was working on big, my big canvases, I was young and I was ambitious and I was, uh, you know, pushing myself to see how big I could go. I love the, the big uh, gesture. Also, my subject matter was, uh, you know, needed space. I was dealing with women that were bigger than life. So my paintings were big. Also, at the time, I was part of the conversation. So I wanted to be seen and to be heard. So my work was big. Now the conversation has changed and uh, I'm not part of it, of course. And uh, my the landscape has changed. Yeah, definitely. So I moved to more intimate subjects and to more intimate sizes. So this one in particular is very important piece for me. In, in 2016 and uh, 2017, my husband's uh, uh, health deteriorated. So I was not able to work at that time at all. But uh, at the end of every day, I was putting down on, on my letterhead. These days we don't write letters, so I have a lot of leftover letterhead. So I was putting down my fears, my hopes, my, my, my fears in general of what is going to happen and how it's go it was going to happen. 
and uh, the medical appointments and uh, even the grocery list. And I continue to keep these notes that helped me go through the difficult time uh, until uh, after Costa's uh, passing. And when I stopped doing that, I ended up with a, a big pile of uh, letterhead. Uh, well, I didn't want to throw it away, but I didn't want also anybody else to, to read it. So I cut the letterhead in strips, and then I woven them back together. And I created 142 uh, works of uh, uh, on paper, yeah, works of art. And uh, then I put them one next to another, placed them one next to another in eight rows. And uh, in this way, if you look at it, you can see that they have transformed all the, all the pain that is written there into something poetic and uh, visually soothing. And the dark pieces are, my husband was a radiologist. So I was fascinated by the images of the sonograms. So I drew with the charcoal some sonograms and uh, I did the same thing. I woven them together, I, I cut them in strips and I wove them together and I positioned them uh, between the, the rest of the uh, square works of, uh, on paper. So th there were also practical considerations to moving to a smaller format, weren't there? You oh, moved, of course, yes. You moved, right, your studio. No, no, this work I did it in my studio. Uh, Oh, so that was later. Yes. Later. So what made you move to a smaller format besides the practical considerations? Well, in that for that particular case, I didn't have the time to work any any at any bigger sizes. Yeah. Um, I've I've interviewed many artists, and there's a number of them who were taking care of uh, their sick husband or their sick wife. Uh, sitting by the sick bed and creating all kinds of works like um, uh, one of them was knitting things, another one was embroidering. Um, and, I, and I asked you before, were you writing some of this while you were at his bedside uh, taking care of him? And you said that, no, you did it when you came home at night as a kind of cleansing and a sort of... Yeah, yeah, of course. A sort of relaxation yes, technique. You had to take care of him, yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, anything else you want to tell us about the the multi pick? Not actually. Okay. So then, let's go to the books. Next slide, please. So this is the book. Oh, yes. The dead letters. The the dead. The, the, yes. In uh, in nineteen ninety two. A year after my father had passed away, I found the courage to open the, the box with his letter, letters, the letters that he had sent me through the years that he was in Greece and I was in, uh, in the United States. I, and I read them and uh, you know, I went back to, to my time with my parents. And when I finished the letters again, I didn't want it to throw them away. So I made bundles of them and I made, created a eight eight or nine objects here you see just one you can mm -hmm. see the big letters mm -hmm. you can see the big letters yeah april 1974. what anyway. was the relationship like with your father oh we were very close with my both parents i was very close yeah and they were very supportive when i said that i wanted to become an artist I said well go ahead well, when I finished with the, with the letters, I wanted to stay a little more with the, my memories. And uh, I started uh, a book, an artist book, which I called the, can we? Next, next uh, slide. The book, the book of the dead, the dad. 
there it's a mixed media and collage uh, uh, art book. And there I try to put down all the memories that I had from my father while I was living with him and all the other stories that I had heard uh, saying through the years about his childhood, about his time in war and uh, so on and so forth. In this particular, uh, these two particular two pages, there is a picture of him on the right side that was taken during a vacation, vacation he took to a Greek island by himself. He was going through a midlife crisis and he wanted to go by, by himself. So, yeah, and uh, there I have some of his writing on the top of the page on the right. On the other side, of course, I have some images of my mother. And my father was very much in love with my mother. And uh, well, that's why I put them there. Beautiful. Right. And that's there's a circular, beautiful circular design of the figures around your father. That's your father in the center. Correct? My father again, yes. Yeah. yeah, the whole book is about my father and has right. pictures of right. him and uh, the rest of the family. Right. Now, the next one, Maruna. Okay. The, oh, next, one. the next one, again, is my father. Oh, oh. no. Go back is... one. Okay. My father, of course. And... Uh, this says Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki is the city where he spent his uh, uh, his high school years, mm -hmm. and they were very important to him because this is where he had his first love, and uh, he started studying music. Actually, he was he had a good voice, and his dream was to become a a, a singer. But uh, the war came, of course, and uh, the plans changed uh, radically. And uh, this is how he met my mother, actually. He went to, to war and he was wounded. And he was transferred to a hospital in, uh, in Athens. And my mother was uh, a, a volunteer. A, a, yeah, she, she was a going nurse. to the hospital to uh, help uh, the, the wounded people. And uh, my, they fell in love and they got married. And that's why I was born during the uh, uh, German occupation. And I remember, I remember now that my parents uh, were saying that uh, during the war, in order to keep themselves uh, warm, they were burning whatever they they could. And at some point, they were burning the music uh, uh, sheets of my father and uh, devalued money. Yes, and there's a there's a uh, a Jewish star on the top left, and that's because Thessaloniki, of course, is the capital. No, 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 no. His first his first love was a Jewish girl. Ah, okay. Tell us about. It. Yeah. Well, historically, Thessaloniki was the the biggest capital of Jewry, right? From it, support. Well, yes. Yeah. Before the war, yes. Yes. And then when the Nazis came, they got wiped out. But uh, the worst horror. But uh, people don't usually realize that there, there was a large Jew Jewish population in, in Thessaloniki. So I wanted to bring that up. No, it's, 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 everybody knows that. Thessaloniki, yes. Yes? Everybody? Yeah. OK. <laughs> in Greece, at least. <laughs> OK, in Greece. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, in Greece they do. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, can we see the next slide, please? Another book, The Secret Life of Ghosts. Well, this is The Secret Life of Ghosts. This is a whimsical book. I love it. And uh, I have uh, I have put together all the well-known uh, uh, <coughs> uh, ghosts. <coughs> Like who? Like who? Casper? Like uh, like Casper the Friendly Ghost and uh, oh, I forgot the other one. Oh, I also have the ghost of, of Hamlet's father. 
I have a lot of ghosts there. Uh -huh. Also my own friendly ghosts. Uh -huh. <laughs> Can we see some other images? Some more images? Oh, this is the bionic ghost. The bionic ghost. Yes. It's, a, it's an image that I cut from a magazine. And I decided to call it the, the bionic ghost. And the other one. Next. And this is the sexy ghost. <laughs> so. Well, this was taken from, uh, of course, it's obvious from a book about uh, Egyptian uh, uh, ritual of death. Beliefs and mummification process, right? Exactly, yeah. From the Book of the Dead, you said. From the Book of the Dead. Right. Well, when I deal with the book, I have an idea that I want to see how far I can go before I exhaust that idea or before I get bored, because sometimes I get bored and I never finish the book. It, it has not happened very, it does not happen very often, but it has happened. Do we have any other images? Yes, we have the next book. Yes, well, this is the untitled. I started this book uh, at the end of uh, 2020. And uh, I started working for not very often because I, I was busy with other stuff. So I didn't spend a lot of time with this book. But uh, during the summer of 2021, uh, two things uh, happened that uh, changed my life. In June or July rather, I moved my studio where I had worked for 33 years home. And you know, this is a very uh, traumatic experience. When you work at the studio, you know you know the atmosphere, you know your space, you feel at home. And uh, when I brought the studio home, I needed some time to adjust and feel uh, comfortable and start working again. But of course, it, I, I didn't start to work because something else happened. In August, uh, next August, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease. And this was a big blow that it took me a long time to, to accept and to start having a life again. And uh, at the beginning of uh, 22, I was able to go back and finish the book. Uh, the book, Usually, when I start a book, after the second or third uh, uh, entries, uh, I know what uh, where I'm going, what the theme will be. With this one, it, there is no coherence in this one. And uh, that uh, signifies, the, that shows the state of my mind at the time. And this is the first time also that uh, I called a work of mine untitled. I like titles because I think that they're very important. As if they're so important as the actual word. So do we have any image from that book? Yeah, we have one. Next slide, please. Oh yes, Killing the Blues. Of course, I had the blues for a long time and uh, I was thought of killing them, but uh, well, it was hard. Sometimes it was very hard. Mm. And uh, I really don't know why we call them the blues. We should call them the black. The blacks. Yeah. <laughs> because they're dark like the night. Exactly. When you cannot fall asleep because yes. you are thinking what will happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. how the disease will progress. Anyway, next. Uh you're an amazing lady. Um, and the next, I, I wanted to ask you the, uh, the one of the final questions in that about where you think you're going to be, your work is going to be going in the future. I really don't know. What I know is that. Uh, what you're doing now. 
what I'm doing now. Yes, and what I'm doing now is I will go back. Years ago at the flea market, I found some uh, old family pictures that uh, I decided to buy. I felt sorry because the younger generation of those families didn't want them and they threw them away. So I bought them and I kept them for quite a few years. And uh, recently I started to go through my own family pictures, my parents, uh, my grandparents, uh, uncles and uh, relatives anyway. And uh, I didn't want to end up, I didn't want them to end up at the flea market or be shredded. So I decided to transform them into art. So let's look at some pictures. This lady, I don't know. I bought that uh, picture at the flea market. Well, and doesn't she? she... Like, a, like a aristocratic lady. So I treated, I treated her aristocratically. <laughs> But that's what doesn't she remind you of Duchamp's label I know the Vash? But of course, Duchamp is always with us, Talia. <laughs> <laughs> so this is great what you did. And you collaged on top of the photo? Yes, yes. And what did you say your grandson your grandson told you? Oh what? yes, I told him, what are you going to do with the family pictures? Dean said Oh, don't worry, Nana. I will take uh, pictures of them and I will keep them in my in my telephone. In other words, she was going to throw away the actual pictures. Now I know I have to do something with my old photos. <laughs> Can we have the next slide, please? Well, this is a picture of my father and his uh, sister when they were kids. They were in the photograph, the actual photograph, they were both together. But uh, for composition purposes, I took them apart and uh, I created what I created. Was it only compositional uh, considerations or were they close? Were they very close or were they uh, somewhat apart? Uh, they were not very close, no. Okay, <laughs> no. so it shows in the in the image. Yes. And uh, this, if you can see in the back of the photograph, I actually this photograph was sent for my grandmother to my grandfather, and she has written something. So I have included some of her writing. Yeah, you collage them. So I, great. Yeah, so I I cannibalized the photograph, but uh, I put it together in a different way. The, mm -hmm. the whole photograph is there, but mm -hmm. in a different way. Right. Different right. form. Can we see the next slide, please? Again, this is a, a family picture. This is my grandparents and my father and uh, aunt. Uh, yeah, aunt and uh, together. Well, uh, large, I, right? Yeah, the family is uh, close together, but uh, the the earth below them is uh, cracking. They had a very uh, adventurous life between different uh, wars. War, yeah, wars. Is was this in uh, Smyrna? That was yeah. That picture was taken in Smyrna. Okay, so you you'll know about the nineteen twenty two Asia Minor incident. That... Yeah, 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 of course, of course. So they were, they had to leave the, the Smyrna uh, in a very bad uh, situation and they moved to Thessaloniki. There's a very, very important... My, my grandfather was a military man, a cavalry man. So in order to save himself, because the Turks were going, were killing all the, Ameri the Greek uh, uh, military people, he dressed up as a, a, a beggar to escape. And the rest of the family went uh, to another way to uh, Thessaloniki, where they got together. Mm -hmm. But not only, but not only the military. May I add, my my. Oh, own... No, of course not only, but uh, primarily the military men. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, they went first, but the, yeah. you know, they they had these these mass killings. So my my in laws' whole family was wiped out. Um. So anyway, um. Smyrna in Flames is the famous book that I was referring to. Mm -hmm, yes. Smyrna in Flames. Okay, next. 
Again, this is another picture of my grandfather on the right side when they were doing uh, exercises, training. Training, military training? Military training, yeah. And this is the Again, the whole grandfather. photograph is there, but in a different, uh, in different shapes. Configuration. This yeah. is the same grandfather who was in Smyrna, who was in Asia Minor? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, and he was on a horse, right? He was in a cavalry. He was a cavalry. Oh, you have seen the picture, yes. No, I remember. You told me yeah, a long yeah. time ago. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, go on. Anything more? I don't think we have another image, but uh, we don't. We don't. I'm planning to continue in this way. I have a lot of photographs, and I don't know where they will take me. Right. I, I want the, the people in the, that are... In the photograph to tell me help me tell their story so if anyone has any 19th century photos please send them to me. early 20th century please send them to despo yeah she tried to take mine but i'm not letting her uh -huh. <laughs> okay um finally i want to like uh note i want to make a note that you from what i see over the years like over 35 years mm -hmm. See you working from the very general, for example, all the themes that you showed us tonight and becoming very biographical. Um, so I wanted to know about that. Uh, we're going from the existential crisis and the existential scream, which is very general, uh, shared by all humanity, uh, to a very specific uh, ending here with your books and your photographs is very and very biographical. Do you have anything to say about this? This is the final question. Well, my final question is that I just turned 80. So the circle is, uh, you know. Coming around. Exactly. Yes, so, all of my work is somehow bio biographical. Now. Yeah. 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 But I guess every artist's work is biographical in one way or another. Well, in a way that not sometimes with what we say about ourselves or what we don't want to say about ourselves. Yes, yes. But through omission or inclusion. Yes, yes, absolutely. How are we going for time, Doug? Well, uh, we're doing fine. What I was going to say, though, is because we don't have anything in the chat as questions, we can allow people, and the audience is, is yeah. a size where we can allow people to just speak. Yeah. So maybe maybe I could start things off by making a few comments and and sure. engage a few people to, to come in and, and speak. Okay. Um, the, you know, what I knew of your work, uh, Despo, was, or my interpretation of what I saw, mm -hmm. was that it was very political. It was, it was... Uh, very much like protest art of a variety of different kinds in in the post-war period, um, from you know Leon Golub to uh, all sorts of people, and uh, very powerful in in that in its nature as political or protest art. And I'm wondering whether that and of course in the nature of it because of the way you draw and the way you would uh, paint uh very expressionistic um was your major motivation though to do uh, political art was that was that at the core i'm a very I'm... political person in general i'm political uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah I, I also noticed there wasn't any you know neither from talia or from you there wasn't any conversation about the the revolution in greece you know the, the, the upheaval in there Greece, was. did there was? I don't remember that, but which did, revolution? Did you because leave the, at the moment the, that you left? Century. No, okay. At the moment that you left Greece, was part of that because of the upheaval of the, the politics? Yeah, I, I no, we didn't leave for that. We came for uh, for my husband to do his residency here. Okay. Okay. No, we didn't leave for that reason. Our intention was, but it was, that. but that was was happening, wasn't it? Around that time, or or I mentioned it. I mentioned it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah. a very bad time again. 
I started my life in Greece with the war and I left with the Honda. The Honda, right. But that's why we left Greece, Douglas. My parents uh -huh. brought me here and with my brother because right. the communists destroyed our, our, our home, uh -huh. burned down, and, you know, we were refugees. Yeah. So that's why we were allowed to come to the United States. Well, that was Greece's loss and our gain. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, in both your cases. Thank you. Or should I say, th those are examples of, of Greek gifts that we should not be afraid of. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, are we Pandora's box, Douglas? <laughs> yeah. I am thank, a, you, uh, thank you, Grace, for those gifts. <laughs> thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, can we also stop the screen sharing so I can see and see that's the a good that's a good idea. Um, there so we, we go. Each okay. other. Uh, when you're um, thank you, by the way, Despo, that was just wonderful. Um, and thank you. You're that, welcome. You. That was uh, lovely to see all your work. Um, when you, uh, when you make the books, do you have an intended, uh, display for those books? Uh, are they different? How do you think them as being different from the paintings or a three, it's a 3D object. And, um, and then I noticed you had these tabs on the pages where the tabs, something yeah. that was a part of the, of the book, but it, can you tell us how you display them or what is the intention of them? Well, a book uh, is also a, an object. It's a sculpture also. So it's a combination of painting and sculpture. Yeah. And, uh, the writing that you said that you noticed, yes, uh, well, I was writing well in Greek. And my dream was to write a little bit, but the English is not my first language, so I have difficulties. So I, I write few phrases. I dare to say few phrases in my book, and let the the images uh, say the rest. So when somebody comes to see the book, is I guess what I'm driving at. I know it's a three D object, but is it something that you would then take? gloves and go through the book just like you would any other book? Is that the intention? No. No. Uh, when uh, I, I started book, I as I mentioned before, I have no idea what the book will be all about. I start working and eventually I saw which way it takes me. I think I think what she's asking is more of a curatorial question. So if I may, I will because I have shown her books many times and she doesn't uh -huh. tell me how to show them. I put them in cases in glass cases. Sometimes I stand them up sometimes, sometimes flat or I just lay them flat. It depends on the show um, or sometimes I'll put them on a shelf. And I'll, or sometimes I'll adjust on a, like a, a podium and I'll, I'll provide white gloves for them to be, turn the pages. Um, I showed them at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Crete and I was really worried. Mm -hmm. Everybody loved these books. They loved them. They went crazy. Especially if you wouldn't believe the children, the young people, the young people just wanted to keep touching them and looking at them and I just had to kind of put myself there and stand there and uh, you know guard them so yeah I could see that yeah. it, it, it and it is a question when you're making that kind of an object and then if you can't turn the pages or you don't look at it that way is it something that's meant to be kept hidden I mean it's it's got it its own pardon me a book has to be touched Right. right. Even yeah. if it's a, the, if there is a danger to be damaged a little bit. And I are, think are, are any of these are any of these books done in the style of a graphic novel where there's a, a narration occurring? There is a narration, of course, yes. But it's not quite linear. Okay. I jump. Okay. 
It's and it, and if this artist, this is this artist is brilliant. I mean, she came up with a solution for people not to be able to read her private notes that she was keeping while her husband was dying. And she cut them up into strips and wove them. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell what what was really written there. She would have come up with another solution. Yeah, I I love I love that piece. That is so interesting. When you wove the particular pages together, uh, how did you attach each square? I'm sorry, I'm asking physical oh, questions. I glued them uh, at the edges. You glued them at the edges. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The pieces are you separate. Did... Every yeah, time yeah. I exhibit them, they, they I, I create a different installation according to the space I have. They are just placed one next to the other. We use push push pins. With uh, yes. Oh, so you actually put them together at the shows. You didn't. Oh, interesting. Okay, you didn't yes. weave it like a quilt. You didn't no, put the, it all the, together. The, the little pieces yeah. themselves are woven. <laughs> I know, I know that part. I got that part. I was just asking how each square was put together with the next square. I could see the woven part in the imagery. Um, yeah, just placed one next to the other. Okay. Pins. Oh, interesting. Okay. Pins. Gino, I'm sure you have a question. Come on. Oh, I don't know. No, not really. <laughs> My question uh, would probably take a long time to answer. So. <laughs> well, that's okay. Come on, ask it. All right. So we'll ask him in the private. Question, the question is, when an artist, such as yourself, Despo, make, um, create um, uh, work that has social or political uh, or sometimes economic um, uh, commentary, I presume like all artists, you want to exhibit the work. What do you expect to happen? What do you think the interaction between the viewer and the work uh, should be? Do you think you can create change in the world, or do you, or are you just telling people how you feel, or what? What? what why do it? Why? Why would you create? Uh, Listen, that's a good question. That's a good question. At the beginning, I was painting, thinking that I would change the world. Now, I don't have this uh, kind of illusions. I just paint what I do and uh, show it to people, and I want to communicate with them my my thoughts. And uh, maybe some people will change their mind by looking at my work about certain things. So do you think uh, doing the work that you do and others do of this type um, is work of consequence in terms of the human condition? Do you think that the work itself uh, merits um, an intellectual um, dialogue between the viewer and the work? Well, unfortunately, the art cannot have changed the world, but some uh, art pieces are so dramatic that... Uh, no, 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 I'm talking about your work, not, not other people. How do you feel? How I feel? As I said before, at the beginning, I thought that I would change the world. Now, I don't think so, but I continue to uh, exhibit my, my thoughts through my work. And struggle, the struggle. We continue yeah. to... Do you think, yes. do you think political, sociopolitical work uh, has a place in our society, or does it become... Um, uh, cultural entertainment. It has become cultural entertainment, I'm afraid. It has become, yeah. But never. No, I, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, of I course. I think it's very important for art to challenge and to, to highlight these issues. But you're preaching to the uh, choir. You're, you're, oh, you're, you're not getting uh, the Koch brothers coming to an exhibition, you're not going to change their mind. You're not going to change Biden's mind or anybody that work at, works at Lockheed. It's other artists who, for the most part, um, are sympathetic to... to True. Uh, so, so True. However, <laughs> however, they will think about it. And perhaps they will change their minds because art has the power to do that. But they're all in agreement. And I've never met an artist that says, I'm for war. I've never met an artist that says exactly. I'm for um, uh, throwing out people out of their homes or I'm mm -hmm. for, um, uh, you know, 
putting uh, ill people to sleep. I've never heard of any. So, any so you're people. saying because artists um, are for a certain, you're saying that all artists are for for a, a particular viewpoint. I'm saying the majority of artists yes. do not sp speak out in favor of what some people would call uh, right wing ideology. And so it's like selling refrigerators to Eskimos. That's what I'm saying. Um, you know, okay. if you have shows these days, could, could you say that people, that people are, people that come to the shows, I mean, who the heck knows? I mean, there's all kinds of venues in different ways, but aren't there statistics that like when you expose people to the arts and when you expose people to uh, uh, these kinds of, thoughts, whatever they might be, that's of thinking, a person that's thinking and creating, that that helps those people. It's like uh, you're seeing the war in Ukraine and suddenly there's somebody sitting there playing a piano and it's uplifting the spirits of the people around them. It's not changing the war, but you're right. trying to change each individual person that you come in contact with. That's what the arts I think in, in my mind are intended to do. I mean, it's not, you you know, what, it's like expecting suddenly, you know, I do work that deals with the poverty and the environment and those kind of things. I'm not necessarily having shows that are dealing in, in those spaces, but it's creating awareness. This whole idea yeah. of just creating awareness, period. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. You're making a presumption that people that go to see exhibitions and go to uh, museums and galleries um, are actually engaging in making change. I mean, um, it's not like they're bringing a, a, a sandwich to a homeless person on the sidewalk. They're, they're not going to see these exhibitions. And like I said, the people that may be responsible for poverty in this country uh, are not going to the kind of shows we're talking about. You're not getting the Koch brothers. I mean, I've seen the Koch brothers go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, God knows what they're looking at. They're certainly not going to get confrontational work. At, at, they're looking at their investment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, but I've seen I've exactly. seen co colleges. I show in colleges, and they bring people, and there are for people from all walks of life that walk in and look at the right. art. I mean, you're right. assuming that nobody but the artists are looking at the art, and it's just not true. At least I don't think so. No, it's not. And I've I've been amazed at the reactions from people and how they're moved by certain things. And mm -hmm. they're not artists. So right. <laughs> yeah. no, how I, do you get I, people I, involved I to vote? I, I personally think that an artist's life that is devoted to uh, raising the consciousness mm -hmm. of the of the viewing public of the the public viewing art, that is a noble thing to do. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter what price the art is at. It doesn't matter. Uh, in, in some ways, it really doesn't matter how many individuals it transforms. But the, the act of dedicating your life to making such art is a noble thing to do. Right. Yeah, but, but the problem great. is that when you have, uh, let's say, artist spaces or uh, not-for-profit small college university uh, galleries, you get a certain kind of person, usually powerless. But when you get the big dollar people, the people that can make global change, they don't go to this kind of exhibition. They don't. I mean, I'd like to think that they do. Look, I, I've done a lot of this in the past, 50 years of it. But the reality is that the people that go to see most of these exhibitions are not people that have any power to make any real change. You may soften their hearts. You may make them feel bad. You may make them think that they should give a little bit more money to Greenpeace. But that's not where the power in uh, mm. this country and other countries, first world you know, countries like Europe and so on, that's not where the power, the power lies with the people that have stocks in Raytheon, Lockheed, Grumman, um, uh, mm -hmm. And so on. That's where the power, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we're at war, we, we're at war at this time, mm -hmm. because we have 
they need to make more profits. And those people are never going to be affected by- I've actually, people. in all the years I've been engaged in this activity, I've actually discovered where the power lies. The power <laughs> lies in thanking uh, Despo Magoni and Talia Vergoupoulos <laughs> for a very engaging presentation. Yeah. And thanking also Wait. our programming committee, our interns, Vote. our volunteers. Vote. Our board members. Yeah. Yes, voting Vote. is good. And thank Vote. you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. Was a very engaging experience. Thank uh, you. Lovely, thank you, Doc. Lovely. Thank you, Doc. And, and Despo, I'm so delighted. Well, thank you for having Despo. So delighted that we had you with us tonight. Really. Thank you so very much. Very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. I loved your work. Just fantastic. Yeah, just thank, thank you, Despo. Thank you. Great so thank, thank you, Despo. And Dahlia thank for you. your thank wonderful you. conversation with her. Thank you. Thank you, Despo. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good night.